sounds great, Eric. Okay, perfect. Yeah. So let's get started. I'm really excited today about our Prospect Live. Uh, typically, we work with uh, you know a variety of companies throughout the year, and this is our opportunity uh, to get in on the ground level of a company that is uh, in the beginning stages of their growth um, and have really enjoyed sharing their vision, understanding their vision of where they want to go with this company. And it's an opportunity for a uh, community that's looking for a, a progressive company with a great business plan to get embedded into their community and grow over the next three years and create positive uh, employee impact in their communities. And so really, this is our way of kind of giving some insight uh, to not only this project, but probably some companies uh, in your own localities uh, that are going through some of the similar challenges and opportunities uh, that we found with um, modern design. So with that, meant, uh, with that stated, Let's talk a little bit about the agenda. Uh, we're first going to meet our GSLI and team and learn a little bit about us. Uh, we're going to give a quick overview of the project to kind of give you a, um, a bird's eye view of what this project means and where uh, it's planning to go. Then we'll actually meet the project. Uh, Neil has put together a wonderful presentation today uh, for us to really understand the scope of the project and timeframes and where they're going. And as always, we'll have a Q&A at the end of our prospect live for you, the community, to ask questions that will help really determine if this company is a good fit for your community. And so that you can put together a proper proposal and proper information to get connected with the company. Who's on the call today? Um, Obviously, a lot of our community clients are on here. We call those our elite cities. They're part of our program, and we work directly with them, understand their communities, and they help us um, put together information that will help attract these companies to their communities. We have some trial communities on here today. These are companies or communities, I'm sorry, that are really trying to understand a little bit more about GSLI's process, how we work with projects, how we create positive job impact on their communities. We've got some observing, observing companies and site locators. I saw Chris Shoup on here from NAI, uh, Robert Lynn, and uh, we enjoy working with that group on projects. And there's some other uh, companies on here that are really kind of taking a look at the process so they can really get a feel for our prospect live and doing one of these and see how it can help their uh, companies. And we also have just observing communities. Those are communities that really just um, project might not be a good fit, but they really wanna see what's the motivating factors, what drives the companies, what goes into their minds when they're doing site locations so they can be better stewards of how they uh, react and submit uh, on projects that are a good fit for them couple housekeeping items. Um, ask all your questions in the Q&A section. Um, that will be put on queue. Uh, Brooke will stop us at any time if there's an important question uh, that relates to a topic that we're talking about. We'll try to get it answered then. But if not, then we're going to reserve those for the Q&A section. Uh, we are transcribing or recording and transcribing this session for you guys to review when putting together your submissions in case you have some questions. Uh, and if you have an interest and you have a uh, question that's kind of complicated, we might ask you to go live and we'll just ask you to raise your hand. That'll pull you out of the audience. We can have you go live and ask your question. Who's with us today? Of course, it's me, Eric Kleinsorge, CEO of Global Site Location Industries. Quick note about me, I founded the company 27 years ago with one purpose. The purpose was to put expanding or relocating companies in touch with communities that could assist them. And it's all about job creation. Um, the more jobs we create on an annual basis, the more impact I feel we're making on the overall economy of our nation. And uh, that's where we really uh, enjoy the process. We've got Brooke Edwards. She is our project director. Uh, Brooke is amazing. She works uh, with our 
projects directly in terms of communication, in terms of research, in terms of gathering data, um, doing all the things that help it be a smooth process from community submitting to company receiving the information. And we also have Neil Summerfield, who is the founder of Project uh, Discovery to Delivery, and the company is Modern Design Platform. And I've really enjoyed talking with Neil over the last uh, couple weeks and really understanding the project and seeing where it could go. With that mi in mind, Brooke, why don't you talk a little bit about our company and what we do and help communities and companies? All right, just making sure you guys can hear me. Um, so yes, thanks so much, Eric. Um, as Eric stated, uh, we are in the business of job creation. So for those of you who are new to GSLI, maybe this is your first Prospect Live webinar, or you've never worked with us before, um, we kind of, we operate from two facets. So we're a site location advisor and an economic development consulting firm. So our core competency at the end of the day is job creation. So growing companies, ideally partner with us to better understand the areas that are going to make sense for their next expansion. So our goal is to educate and help understand what it is that they're looking to achieve with their expansion, what are their needs, and marry that up directly with the communities that we uh, rely heavily to understand and, and get that education piece together uh, for our clients. And so um, our goal is just to marry the two and create jobs throughout that process. So we differ a little bit um, from the state, and, and Eric can uh, show on that next slide, but um, we manage RFPs different because we don't issue them out to the state. We actually go through our clients, and that is the elite cities network of, uh, of members that we work with. These are all communities, and our focus is just to make sure that they have a pipeline of opportunities to present optimal sites uh, to the project's executive team. So this just means they're presenting their sites to a project that might not have realized that they have opportunities or, you know, there's some site selection groups that just go directly to uh, the existing buildings, but we work directly with the communities to see if there's a marrying of solutions and assets that that community possesses to be able to really help that project up out and uh, to kind of get on that short list to look at that location a bit further. Um, so what you are seeing here is our project portal. And we have about 115 active projects in the portal right now. Uh, these are projects that have expressed, they are expanding, they have a need for a new facility location or a new greenfield site. Uh, they are gonna create jobs. So similar with Neil's uh, project here, uh, we, we have a plethora of different options of projects that are housed in the portal. So all different industries, all different scopes and sizes, disciplines, products, and needs. And so um, what makes it different is that EDOs can just quickly fill their pipeline with qualified leads by just filtering through the projects and then make quick site submissions from there. Uh, and then after that, they can track the project, submit, um, kind of edit their submission or just check the status of the project. And uh, as you can see here, you can just go to gsliprojectportal.com to learn more and to look through, through those projects. We've spent hundreds of hours developing this portal and it's all from the feedback of economic development clients. Uh, we rely heavily on developing this, this portal so that you guys have um, a better tool for business attraction efforts all within a few clicks. So uh, hopefully that helped explain a little bit about um, how easy it is to utilize. And we, we do have an upcoming trade show, um, which is this next coming week. That's at the IEDC Oklahoma City uh, Annual Conference, which we're looking forward to attending. Um, and then we are going to be exhibiting at the FabTech show. So I'm sure many of you know about that show. It's a fabrication metalwork show, and we're going to have a GSLI booth and major presence there. And we're really looking forward to it because uh, we do have quite a few clients that are going to be attending and showcasing their areas there. Um, and that is a part of uh, the elite program to be able to attend with us and exhibit at the shows. Yeah, Here's Brooke. a poll. We want you guys yeah. to take a second to answer. Um, a, are you guys attending IEDC in Oklahoma next week? This just gives us an idea of, um, you know, we'd be able to meet up or, or say hello or see if you'd want to stop by the booth and say hi uh, while you're there. And then the second question is if you're currently implementing any trade shows back into your marketing efforts. We just, we do a lot of 
polling to better understand um, just through COVID what's changed and what's on the horizon um, for budgets, for marketing, and, and just is trade show the next um, kind of horizon of, of continued marketing efforts. And uh, so we're just curious, what does that look like for you? All right. Thank you guys so much for answering. So we also just want to uh, say a huge shout out to our um, Fabtech show sponsors. These are all of the communities that have decided, hey, I want to get myself in front of the fabrication metalwork audience and showcase that we are here with GSLI ready to make a difference um, by being a community that's eager to bring in your business to our area. So we've partnered with all of these awesome communities. They are current clients of ours, and uh, we're going to be making a huge slash at this show. Uh, we're, we're doing it big, so we're really excited that they're joining us and that they've partnered with us to be able to um, just really highlight their, their assets and their, their value proposition to a growing industry. We are hosting a master series webinar coming up. Um, it's about FAM tours and Eric and I, we attend a lot of FAM tours. Um, and so we are really excited to be able to talk with Mike Grella of Grella Partnership Strategies. He's a really good friend of ours and uh, we have been on numerous uh, events together and I've been on, on FAM tour events with Mike. And so we have a lot of, <laughs> excuse me, great <clears throat> ideas. Uh, to be able to share some valuable insight just as a site selection uh, consultant on how we believe communities could better their strategy as they host FAM tours for site selectors coming in. So that's one that we don't want you to miss, especially if you're eager to amp up FAM tours in your community or uh, you're looking to bring in additional uh, site selectors or consultants or um, anyone in the commercial real estate space. This is going to be a really good uh, show. Lots of insight, uh, especially from Mike and uh, Eric our team. Eric, I know that this was something you've been working on, so I'm going to let you talk a little bit about it. Um, yeah. Yeah, th this is a really exciting opportunity. Our publisher of Global Trade, Brett Ronk, he really was the implementer behind this, and they had reached out to us. It's called Going Global, and it's a show that's uh, hosted in London, and um, th it is also sponsored by the U. Uh, United Kingdom Department for International Trade. What it is, is purely for businesses in Europe looking to do business overseas and open up operations. So they felt there was a great match between our, our publication, which is Global Trade Magazine and GSLI. And through that, we had been talking and I started thinking what an opportunity it might be for our cities and communities that are looking to bring businesses uh, from the international um, market and, and have them do it. We have helped several companies this year uh, plant roots here in the U.S. and that's always been exciting because it's new business, new opportunity uh, that's come from overseas, not just from uh, the United States. So if you could, I'm just throwing this out there as an opportunity and I'm really exploring uh, we plan on possibly going out there in November to check out the show and really do something in 2023. But just asking if you, you know, if your uh, community has an international focus, if this is something you'd love to attend as a marketing trip, as an exhibitor, if we got a booth together, um, take a few minutes and just answer the poll. That'd give us a little insight on where we go with this show. But right now we are... Uh, a major sponsor over there and plan on getting uh, good exposure and uh, identifying some companies this year from that. So with that, I'll kind of, we'll leave that poll up there, let you guys have a few minutes to answer. Um, I'm going to go ahead and give you some project insight. Um, we here at GSLI, I call them lead pillars. So they're, think of them as silos and we have different ways that we go out and identify leads that include nurturing, magazine advertising, telemarketing, internet research, um, and, and uh, other venues like trade shows. And what we do is we analyze each of those pillars each year to see what the value is to our organization in terms of project generation. This particular project came through one of our nurturing programs. Um, which is an email campaign that educates over 40,000 companies on how we can help them um, 
in their site selection process uh, to make it easier and, and more simple. Neil reached out to me from this nurture uh, email and, and communicated with me. And from there, we developed a relationship. Ashley Klein, Sorge on our team, uh, began communicating with him and we developed and found out that this would be a great opportunity for our communities. And that just kind of gives you a little bit of insight on how we came across this project. Um, if you could, because I've talked with Neil about this, but I'd like to just in a general sense, because there's a couple of companies out there that have really, that we've helped take advantage of these programs, but would like to find out if you have an incubator program in your community currently, uh, have one in place, whether or not it's, um, it's reserved space, or if you have work with the colleges, do you have an incubator program in place? Got a couple here. Exciting. All right, we'll continue. So it looks like uh, heavily weighted on, well, not heavily, about a 60-40 um, ratio on yeses to nos with the nos being the 40%. So opportunity there, um, um, but one that might fit with this project, but not necessarily has to fit with this project. Uh, and you'll see as we go through uh, the, the presentation, um, of what a community can do to help accelerate this company into um, greater, more advanced stages of the project. So with that said, Neil, I'd like to bring you on. Yes, hello from Miami. Hey, Neil, how are you doing? Fine, thank you. Again, Good. so excited to have been talking with you and working with you over the past couple of weeks. Um, I really enjoy the project. I think it's, a, it's fast growing in terms of the um, industry that you're reaching and very, very innovative in terms of the process that you're going through. And I want to thank you for putting together this presentation today. And with that said, I'll just kind of turn it over to you to kind of give some insight on the project. Surely. Um, uh, so, yes, let's go to the first um, slide. Um, I'll take about five, six, seven minutes just to go through. Um, most of these slides are self-explanatory. Um, so on most, I'm going to step aside, except to say here that um, we'll talk a little bit about who we are, why we're talking to the development authorities, uh, what our needs are, and um, a timetable, and I'll share something about our team. So uh, on the next slide, all right, just a, a little background on uh, who we are. I believe that uh, you have shared some of this information with um, the development authorities in terms of the industry that we're in, the type of uh, product we have, um, the source of those products, which is largely Europe and the kinds of clients. I, I do want to emphasize that we're building a global business uh, if you look at hospitality projects of the kind that we work on, whether they're in Shanghai or Cairo, Abu Dhabi, Rome or Miami, um, they feature the same products from the same sources. And so there is no reason, given the fact that the Internet, and I'll talk a little bit about how that works for us in a second, but given the Internet being a global tool, um, and the products all coming from one source and ending up in the same kinds of projects around the world, there's absolutely no reason why we couldn't build, can't build, in fact, intend to build a global business. Now, we're in a very early stage, of course, but perhaps it's important to say that we're the only company that is approaching this particular market in the way that we're approaching it. Now, the issue would be, well, okay, so how big is it? Well, it's actually a billion dollars big, um, and that's just the initially addressable market. So uh, there is a significant opportunity for us to build a very significant business. Uh, the next slide deals with or shows an architecture of our platform. Now, we're part of a sort of modern wave of technology-enabled businesses. This is 
the architecture of our internet platform. Uh, it will take, uh, it could take seven days, not seven minutes to discuss this in detail. So I'm gonna pass along and uh, we'll come back to it in a conversation with interested parties, I'm sure. But just to say that usually internet platforms combined with technology uh, are virtual. Underpinning our platform, in fact, are bricks and mortar. This is the physical products, uh, furniture, furnishings, rugs, uh, wallpaper, and the logistics of distribution. So this really does have, even though it's a technology-based business, it has a very important bricks and mortar um, component. Now, um, on the subject of bricks and mortar, I want to share with you an experience from the 2000s, because I think this can be instructive. Of the two primary drivers uh, in the early days of Winwood, and I'm sure uh, everyone in the development communities uh, aware of Winwood and its success. Two of the primary drivers were Mr. Goldman. I knew him well, unfortunately, no longer with us of Goldman Properties, and, and David Lombardi. Um, I, I reached out to David a couple of weeks ago. Next slide, Derek. Um, uh, to ask if he would be prepared to share a reference, because I didn't want to say this, I wanted somebody else to say it, although I know it to be true. Um, and I, I think it's important, I'm rather proud of this. David's, the end of David's reference was, his warehouse was one of the first walls of Windward, and it is no exaggeration to say that he was one of the early pioneers responsible for what has now become one of the most vibrant entertainment and commercial hubs in the country. I'm rather proud that we were, we recognized what Winwood could become and we were part, not, this is not modern design platform, this is a previous company, but in a similar industry. And I'm rather proud that we were able to recognize what Winwood could um, become. Uh, the next two slides to show you quickly what the space became. It was disused warehouse to begin with. Um, on the left, you'll see the garden. Uh, that is actually Dolce Vita, Dolce Vita, the movie playing in the background. We used to have open nights. There would be gallery walks ultimately when Winwood became between the disused warehouse and what Winwood has become today. Believe it or not, it was a gallery district and we used to have uh, open nights, um, this, we opened the garden, the showroom, we played Italian movies because we sold Italian furniture, um, served drinks and so on. And um, it was a, a, a wonderful way to introduce this area to the community. On the right, you'll see the event spaces that we had at the front of the showroom. And on the following page are the interior spaces of, uh, of the warehouse. Uh, this was truly a disused warehouse when we um, when we inherited it. So we um, we did a fair job of uh, dressing it up, making it look really interesting, selling furniture, and as a result, building the um, uh, traffic in the community. So down to brass tacks. Let's quickly look at opportunities. The obvious one, of course, is warehousing and distribute uh, distribution of our products. Um, they are made in Europe, they are packaged in cartons, put into containers. Those containers are brought to the United States, 95% on board ship, occasionally by plane, but almost always by ship. Uh, when they come in, they are broken down uh, in a warehouse. The cartons with furniture in it are then repackaged into project containers because they're coming from different manufacturers, but they go to one project. So they're broken down, put into project containers and shipped out. So uh, obviously the first opportunity for us with respect to development becomes the warehousing and distribution of those products. But with development support, there are uh, two or three other uh, opportunities which I'd like to share. One is the management and integration of quick ship programs. Now, the Italian luxury furniture manufacturers um, make almost everything custom. Uh, it's a standard product, but it's customized. Um, however, they lose a lot of business through not being able to supply that business or the 
need for immediate need for furniture um, if it comes from Europe. So they warehouse some products. They are best selling products in the best finishes, fabrics and so on. They warehouse those products in the United States, each individually. Um, so you literally have hundreds of these so-called quick ship warehouses. Often they're very poorly managed. One business opportunity for us is to bring all of these quick ship programs together and integrate them under one roof and manage them. Um, it's a tremendous business opportunity. There, the, the offtake would be e-commerce shops and retail shops and some direct to consumer. Um, but it's an existing business that needs managing integration and, and, and good management. A second business opportunity is in the local storage and customization of frames, sort of following on from QuickShip. Um, uh, this is where a wooden a chair or a stool or a coffee table is kept in raw form, so it's not finished, and it can be painted, lacquered, um, fabric and foam added if it's a chair or upholstery. And in this way, uh, available instead of being available in 16 weeks from Europe, production and uh, uh, shipping can be available in four or five or six, which makes a very significant difference to the opportunity for these products to be sold. There is no one currently doing this in the United States for the luxury companies. Um, there was a company at one point which broke apart as a result of a family feud. It's not been replaced. We see it as an opportunity. Um, we can discuss it in more detail, but the conversations I've had with a couple of people involved uh, uh, tell me that there was millions of dollars worth of business that flowed through this company each year, which is there for the taking, we think. Um, oh, hold on one sec, really quickly, because I hadn't got this, thank you, I hadn't got this point um, in the deck. Um, we believe that we can be a resource to the projects moving to your community. So, for example, if it's a hotel, um, obviously, whether it be a company, a hospitality project, a retail or sort of corporate headquarters, these companies need furniture um, of some kind. We believe there could well be an opportunity for us to partner with you, uh, the development authority, to offer this resource to companies moving to your community. Um, we are able, because of the profit margins in furniture, to put together really advantageous deals. We think it could help you. Um, and I will say that the seed funding that we require, um, it's $300,000, could be recovered with the sale of a million dollars worth of furniture. Now, there's not a hotel I've ever seen that spends less than a million dollars on interior architecture, wallpaper, furniture, and so on. So that the seed funding that we're looking for through some kind of arrangement could be recouped, it seems, from the sale of furniture on projects moving to your community that we could partner with you on. I, just a thought. So um, what are our needs? Our headcount needs are by the end of next year, uh, based on the current program, will be not large, 25 to 30, technology people, office staff, administration, and so on. This does not include the manpower for warehousing and the artisan crafts that I've described to you. So whatever that, whatever they would employ is in addition to the 25 or 30. The initial requirements for the activities I've described space-wise could be in the order of five to 6,000 square feet. Now, is there or should, be, should there be a showroom? Um, well, it depends on the location, uh, how close you are to a major uh, city, whether uh, furniture is a big deal in that city. High Point, for example, in North Carolina, um, there are uh, lots of, uh, there's, there's artists and craft in High Point, there is uh, uh, manufacturing, there is warehousing, there's distribution out of that community. Um, 
uh, a uh, facility for us in that location might be of a different size than if we're going to a community in which there is no artisan craft available to us and we perhaps have to train people. So um, uh, let's just say five to 6,000 square feet to begin the conversation. Now, with respect to the ask and the timetable, um, we're looking for, in terms of seed funding, um, Eric, one more slide. Uh, in terms of seed funding, we're looking for $300,000. The current valuation of our business is about 5.5 million. So $300,000, if you look at Shark Tank, is, <laughs> is worth discounted about 5% of the equity. Um, but as I said, a million dollars worth of furniture, and then that gets recovered. Um, what is the money used for? Because it needs to be in a cash form. We have to build our technology. We have to build our team. We have 50,000 products, data that we have to enter into our database. And then we have to get on the road and find ways to sell that while the technology is being completed. So uh, the $300,000 is a cash so I would say that we do have business. Um, we have an existing business that generates 30 to $40,000 a month in revenue, but we're pumping that back into the development process. Um, but we are, we, we are a real business, not just a, a group of sort of pimple face kids with um, a technology idea. Although, as you can see, I'm not a kid. Um, lastly, on the team. Um, I have recruited a group of people that is capable of making this a global business of significant size. Uh, Javier Top Center was general manager at um, Henkel, $900 million profit and loss responsibility. Um, Nikki Top Right uh, is a behavioral change scientist. She's very important to our ability to communicate with designers through the web. Uh, bottom right, Harvey, my son, actually, uh, a director at Warner Brothers Discovery, who would be involved in events. Um, and we've just recruited, actually, a technology advisor who led the team at uh, Benmo. So very, very successful technology chap. So there you are, Eric, um, Brooke, really quickly. Um, that's, um, that's our pitch. Great. Thank you. Um, really appreciate that, Neil. And very excited. I want to kind of go into the Q and A um, portion of our prospect live. This is the opportunity. If you guys have specific questions about the project, and they will help you better align and say, "Hey, this is a project worth submitting on, and one that would be well aligned with the assets that we have available in our community." Uh, that this is the time to get those questions out and 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 uh, answered. We do have some prepared questions. We'll start with those, but as those encourage you with other questions, please put them down in the Q&A box by clicking on the Q&A. Please provide your name and location and then your question. And that way we kind of get a feel for where you are in the country. So Neil, um, talking about your five year vision a little bit more, help communities understand where you want to take this business and, and what it can mean to them in terms of um, helping build their economy and their in their own communities. Well, this is actually one of the reasons why I included the Winwood story, because I think that, um, you know, we chose Winwood. Now, of course, we're talking 2006, 2007, right? But we chose it because a lot of the people, companies that sell luxury furniture are quite literally palaces, right? They're, they're, they're sort of very expensive retail marble hall type outlets. If any of your um, uh, audience has a been the Italia shop or a casino or flex form shop in their community, they will know what these uh, are like. We chose Winwood because we were actually moving into a deserted warehouse, uh, a disused warehouse in a deserted area. And so it was all about the furniture and it wasn't about marble hallways and sort of, it was about good design, good interior architecture and furniture being made to look beautiful. 
And so one of my thoughts, and the, one of the reasons to include that, is that not every community has, you know, the sort of modern factory type space available. And it's not necessary for us to have that because I mean, the warehouse space is not large. Um, and I feel that if there are, there may be a community that has an area that is a little like Windwood was when we found it, um, where we could spark um, uh, an interest in traffic to the community. Having done it once, we can certainly do it again. And I think that's sort of a, of interest to certain types of communities with certain types of um, uh, real estate available. I, another could be a community that has some of these crafts. You know, the uh, furniture making is very specific with paint. Um, fabric making doesn't necessarily have to relate to furniture. Um, uh, where they want to build these sort of centers of excellence, you know, a little bit like sort of the jewelry district in New York or something, right? So something like that, I think we could uh, help spark or be a part of. Um, let, me ask, let me ask you, Neil, because I've, I've toured uh, several cities and a lot of them have what's called brownfield projects or brownfield areas, which are really uh, depressed um, areas in terms of a vacant factory or a vacant warehouse that have really sat there and not really been developed. How far down or how far could you go like um, in terms of a, a conversion or bringing a, a brownfield project up to up to par for a community? Well, I think one of the, of course, one of the advantages of Wynwood is that it's part of Miami. And Miami is a sort of a gateway for people going south and a gateway for people coming from South America coming into the United States. So Miami has some very particular advantages. Um, and Wynwood was able to take advantage of all of those people converging, plus the climate, of course, and, uh, and so on. Um, for us to create the same kind of effect, traffic, uh, 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 use of old space and so on, there needs to be someone that wants to see it, right? So, so you have to be in a location where you can attract, for that, you need to be in a location where you can attract people where they can easily reach you, um, where there might be some interest. For example, Eric, it's very interesting to note because there's virtually no modern design luxury furniture sold in Orlando. The, the three biggest purchasing agents of modern design luxury furniture are in Orlando. So who knew, right? And I think because of Disney and some of the other companies that are based there, uh, they have sort of formed this industry of purchasing agents, which has become a very important center. So these are the kinds of things that, you know, depending on which is the community, what are the local, what's the distribution of, of traffic of people moving through that community, whether there are centers of architecture or whatever locally, it, it, what, it, what it looks like, what we would look like in that community is to a certain extent going to depend what's in the community now. But I believe that we can add a spark and want to, because we one of the things we most enjoyed about the 2000s was the, what we created in Wynwood uh, and how enjoyable it was to be part of that. Absolutely. Thank you. I've got a question here that came in from uh, Jamie, and they are from Montana uh, Department of Commerce. And it kind of feeds into our second question. Um, we want we kind of I'd like you to expand a little bit about the customers and industries that you serve. So what's your total market that you really want to serve? But Jamie asks, you know, are you looking to be in a certain region of the country? And if not, um, well, she says she'd love to have you in Montana. But uh, is there a certain region um, that makes more sense for you in terms of the product line? Are you pretty much open to being able to supply your product from anywhere in the U.S. where you set up? Yeah, no, we're, um, we're really very open about it. Um, as you can tell, I'm English, right? So I, I'm sort of, um, I've been in this country since 1983. I've been in Miami for the last 20 years. I'm do a change. 
So I'm not looking to stay or our business to be based in Miami. Uh, we're looking to relocate it to wherever it feels like we can be welcome. Uh, now, it's a little easier if we're, let's say when we're importing furniture, that we are in some fashion, uh, I mean, for example, Miami would not be a good place to do what we plan to do because it takes 10 hours to drive out of Miami. So if you've got goods in a warehouse in Miami and it takes you eight or 10 hours to get out of Florida, sorry, not Miami, out of Florida, uh, going north, that's not a good location for what we're looking to do, right, in terms of warehousing. So um, uh, road and rail is very important to us. Road in particular, because the containers come off ships, they get collected, they're brought to the warehouse, broken down, and then moved on project containers. So to be in some fashion um, in sync with roads and railways is very, very important. Uh, could it be that it would be better closer to a major port? It could be, um, uh, but those there aren't that many. New York, New Jersey, um, there's one in the Carolinas, Miami, Brownsville, long uh, um, uh, in Los Angeles, and then going north, maybe Seattle. So there are not many of those locations that that we could look at, but obviously ports are important. Um, uh, but um, if there is a culture, for example, some communities have are able to boast of technology people coming out of their universities, right? They're sort of they have major technology programs that can be quite important to us because of our need to build technology. Um, there are certain communities like the West Palm Beach that I know of that. Uh, the direct mail industry was always very important, and uh, there's a lot of data entry type expertise in uh, in those areas. So really, it's um, there is no specific. Um, oh no, we should we need to be in New York or we need to be in California. We have a very open mind, Eric, about uh, about where we locate. It's just that we have to have a good reason. And I, I've tried to give you some of what those reasons, you know, some of what they might be. Yeah, absolutely. Um, that kind of segues into this next question. And for the past three years, I would say almost four years, really um, hot topic has been workforce, not just from the company side, but from the community side and developing their workforce and making sure they have a good workforce for your uh, company or other companies looking to move there. Is there any certain types of employees that you're really looking for in terms of um, the opportunity and, and knowing that you have a sustainable workforce, if it, if it grows beyond your 30 or goes uh, larger, you talked about uh, the manufacturing uh, model eventually, possibly. So how important in workforce and what type of employees are you looking to hire? Well, I, I think, first of all, because primarily um, our business is going to be driven, as in the leads the, and the sales that we make, uh, will be driven by the technology, technologists, programmers, people that are aware of, I mean, you have coders, programmers, uh, very, very important to us, without which we cannot build our platform. Uh, so that's important. Um, uh, the adoption of technology is interesting, right, in our industry, because it's very old school. Uh, the furniture industry is as old as time. I mean, you know, caves have furniture, right? So certain segments of the furniture industry are still old school. So it's very difficult to go find someone with furniture industry experience and then um, ask them if they've ever used co -brows. Co-browse is when you control the browser of your user in a sort of audio-visual sense, and you can facilitate the specification of products in a project, for example. We intend to use a lot of co-browse, but we can't really take furniture people, right, who, because they're, they, don't know, they're, um, they don't know technology, and oftentimes my experience with them is that they're not necessarily open to learning. So we have to teach... Uh, younger people who are open to the use of technology about furniture, right? So that's a very important part of what we're going to have to do is 
uh, the, the culture of, or the, the knowledge of the history of design, right? You know, from uh, the 50s, which is when really the modern movement started up to the modern day, the understanding of the history of design and of color and fabric and texture and so on. These are all things that we need to take young people who are skilled or open to the use of technology and, and teach them about, uh, if that answers your question. So start with technology. There's a learning sort of culture and so on about uh, design. Um, and then otherwise, data entry and you know those sort of typical sort of technology related skill sets okay perfect um so circling back to the seed funding the three hundred thousand dollars and and going after that are you looking for private investors from a community or are you looking uh could a uh, an incentive from a community help i've worked with a project that tiff funds were used in terms of helping uh get a project often started uh, uh, in inside of their community, um, what's what's your preferred or what's the best way in terms of your funding uh, so that you can also maintain control of the company? Um, well, we've only just started our fundraising. I mean, the in fact, my very first investor com uh, conversation took place at the um, end of last week, so we're just at the beginning stages of it. I, I think one of the the criteria that I've personally set is that I would like this investment uh, to come from the, uh, someone who will be a long-term partner. Um, so if it's from an investment company, uh, I would like them not to see it as a, okay, so 10 times my investment in five years, I want to be out. Uh, we would like, I would like to find an investor, if it were to be an investment company, venture capital company, who sees the long-term potential in what we're doing. Because frankly, um, the next five years is just scratching the surface uh, of what this business could become, right? We will uh, simplify the process using the using technology, lean process and platform. We will simplify process. But after that, we've got ideas for how we're going to revolutionize design itself using imagery and, and the AI machine learning and so on. So there's, there's, there are lots of opportunities to get stuck in and do some very important things. And I, I think it just would be beneficial uh, to us if this very first funding that we get comes from someone or it, uh, someone that's a party to it that uh, uh, has long-term interest. I, I think the same goes for development authorities. I, I, I can imagine, and I don't know what mechanisms your clients or development authorities would use to provide it, but the idea that we set up shop and build this sort of compound um, in a community that's been involved with us from the very beginning is very exciting, right? So again, it's long-term. It's not, you know, okay, so we can turn your $300,000 into 5 million and we'll, you'll ride off into the sunset, you know, five years from now. I, I think there is such a lot to do. There's such a lot in this idea. And I have this sort of slightly Pollyanna view that it would be really nice if we could sort of do it with, you know, a relatively small number of committed and interesting parties. Okay, right. So you kind of touched on this in terms of the importance of, uh, or how um, having direct access to a port could be an advantage. Uh, you also talked to me um, about, um, for example, High Point, North Carolina, I believe it was, in terms of the cluster there, the industry cluster that makes sense uh, and I believe, I'm assuming that's because of the artisans and, and, and things that would be present already. Um, are there any certain criteria that you'd like to see in a community uh, from an industry cluster that would help you be more successful and advance your plan quicker? Well, um, uh, High Point is, a, is an obvious example because that's where a lot of the American furniture industry was. It, it is less clustered in High Point today than it was 20 years ago, but, but there are still 
artists and skills there uh, that are important. Um, uh, Las Vegas could be interesting because of the market. Chicago, because of the merchandise mart. Um, there are all kinds of different reasons why a community might make sense, right? I mean, it, it doesn't just have to be artists and skills. It can be technology. It could be um, outlets for product to create revenue. Um, uh, you know, there's no... Um, I, I think that this might sound as if we don't quite know what it is that we want, but, the, but truthfully, we have a very clear vision for our, our, our company. And we understand that a lot of things could influence it and, and, and sort of turbocharge its progress. Um, and there are a lot of things, right, from the money to the technology to sort of the artisanship to the availability of development space and so on. So um, uh, I find it difficult to be really specific in answering that question. Um, uh, I would prefer to deal with it in sort of specifically with the respect of a particular community, and then we can get granular on the benefits of that uh, of that community versus what we need, you know, and vice versa. Okay, so I always try to dive into the mind of of, of the company in terms of the tipping point because sometimes there's there's things that are underlying that that could make a difference if a community is making a submission that they really want to address in their submissions. Are there any tipping points that would push you if there were two equal areas that would kind of uh, cause you to say, hey, this community is going to win our project over another community? Um, no, I, I, I think I've dealt with the, um, all the factors that would go into the decision. And I, um, I, I it would be because there are a number of them I don't think there's any one issue uh, that would be a tipping point. It looks to me as if there are if there are some choices for us out there, it would be a combination of many of the things that we've talked about. The only thing that I haven't um, raised is the you know we're we're very allied or associated with construction. So whether it be uh, large construction companies that build hotels. Um, uh, or resorts, or even construction companies that build large numbers of, you know, large and sort of wealthy family homes. Um, an association with a construction company or developer or a large real estate company, because we're so, uh, you know, a sort of aligned with, with that sort of industry could be very interesting because what do we need a house for our furniture? What do they need furniture for their house, corporate office, retail showroom, corporate entities or hotels, resorts, right? We're very kind of aligned with uh, development, construction, real estate. So that's the only other thing that I had not mentioned previously. Okay, great. We've got two more questions on ours. We haven't had any questions flow in yet, except from Jamie. Jamie, thank you for that question. If you have any, we're running up on the hour. So we want to try to be respectful of your time as communities and end at one o'clock or two o'clock our time. So if you do have a question, please get it in there. I don't want to leave uh, anyone out if they have questions. But um, the next question, this might be a question if you've ever talked to communities about this, but um, have you considered or, or talked with any communities about joining an innovation hub or taking advantage of some of the accelerator programs that the different economic development organizations can offer? Um, uh, truthfully, we have not, Eric. Um, uh, I am not sure that I fully understand what those benefits are. Uh, and if they exist, I would love to know about them if they can help push our business forward. But, okay. but I, oh, I, I have no experience of that. Perfect. All right. The last question that we have, um, many communities have startup resources and tools that will help a business. And, and that's the purpose is to help you be successful. Um, what information would you like them to present to you in response to your needs in, in terms of being able to evaluate and, and really consider what type of opportunities they have? 
Well, um, um, I hate to be mercantile, uh, but I suppose I need to be, right? It, should, it has to start with the money. Um, uh, we need the funding for the, um, to build the business, which then will fill the spaces that we're talking about and hire the people uh, that we're talking about today. So um, this opportunity, and I'm very grateful for it. Uh, thank you very much for giving it to us to talk to your um, clients. Uh, we are considering it, of course, alongside, will do, um, uh, uh, seed funding from venture capital companies, from family offices, and um, a range of sort of financial institutions. Uh, so we have to start there um, because something in lieu of the cash funding um, won't cut it for us because we need to hire people by technology and so on. So it starts there. Beyond that, I, I, I think the answer is, as I gave before, it's a combination of different things. I mean, it, it, there are clearly some benefits to being close to a port or a road or rail hub. Um, there are benefits to be close to um, artisan, and I can't think of other areas than High Point, but there are probably many in the United States that have these kinds of skills. Um, there would be some benefit from being close to those. I think that we've talked about a lot of what those benefits would be. I guess for us, it's just a question of trying to sort of balance um, the different elements from different communities, should there be more than one. Um, uh, but I don't think there's anything in particular that stands out apart from the point, as you would say, getting to first base, which is, you know, the, um, uh, the seed funding. Perfect. All right. We don't have any questions. If you do, please feel free to get them in. Brooke, if you could, let's talk about the submissions. Absolutely. So we're going to put up a quick submission poll that just asks if you're interested in making a submission on this project. And that's just to give us a little insight of whether you guys are um, going to need any type of assistance or follow up and just helping craft that. Uh, we do work with our clients to make sure that there is a nice cover letter and just ways that we can help offer any type of guidance uh, when crafting that RFI response. We are going to be um, requesting that your submissions come in by October 7th, and that's at 5 p.m. Central, and you will just make sure that you are going to go straight to our project portal, which is gsliprojectportal.com. You're going to type in the code name, which is discovery to delivery, and you're going to be able to submit your proposal right within the system. It's a very simple, seamless, easy process uh, to be able to do so. After that, we're going to go through and just look at member versus non-member submissions. Uh, we always start with looking at members uh, because they're uh, obviously the ones that are wanting to you know, have a first at bat opportunity uh, to work with the projects. And um, so then we'll go through and look at non-member submissions after that. Um, and I'll be working with our team with Ashley and with Neil to be able to go through those reviewing uh, just all the information uh, that you choose to submit. And it just sounds like, Neil, that um, you're going to want solutions presented to some of those needs that you mentioned. And you want to hear specific ways that communities can help assist. And even I know with the incubator fund, I mean, that's a lot of communities do have those types of funds and entrepreneurial type resources for small businesses. So yes. I'm sure you're going to want to see a lot of that type of information in, in those responses. Uh, if they have the programs, if they have the resources, go ahead and outline them and, and let us know who the contacts are to get connected with, especially for any type of funding needs that might uh, be able to, uh, the, the community can assist with. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, last note, um, there will be a recording and a transcription that will be sent from me. And so just keep an eye out. It's uh, email brook.edwards at gslisolutions.com. And you will see that uh, here in the next 24 hours. And that will be sent out to uh, those that attended and didn't attend. Uh, so we'll make sure to get that to you. So uh, whitelist it if you haven't already. So if you're interested, uh, we've got a couple of community assessment directors, Amanda Tompkins and Carol Harris. They are the uh, team that puts together the communities for us uh, for these opportunities to be presented to the 
uh, companies. So if you're interested in learning more about GSLI, not just this project, but other projects and being able to help us um, find locations for these companies, please reach out to us. We'd love to, to give you any information that you can. The bigger um, uh, our portfolio of communities grows, the better we can assist companies. And we'd truly love to talk with you if you aren't uh, currently familiar with us. Uh, but with that said, it is three minutes past. So I would like to thank Neil. Thank you so much for your time over the past couple weeks uh, in terms of educating us about your project. We're excited about partnering with you and helping you find a, a new location for your project. Uh, and thank you to the communities. I know how busy you are running your communities and to take an hour out of your time to listen uh, to a project to see if it's a good fit is uh, really important. And we really appreciate and thank you for that time. Uh, until next time, I'm going to say goodbye. And until we have our next prospect live, we'll see you next time. Thank you. Thanks very much. Everyone, thank you.